I think it's mainly two areas where we are different from other gem labs. One is the past. We have a history of 100 years during which we were privileged to um, see a big share of the important gemstones of the world. So this gives us a wealth of experience, a wealth of data. The other one is then more uh, towards uh, the future, or how we are looking into the future. I think that's part of the Gubelin culture. You know, Gubelin is a curious company. We are um, very open to look into new ways, new technologies, and we are very early in adopting these technologies and trying them out. And what we have also done, particularly in the last, say, 10, 15 years, we have shifted our focus from looking what is good for us over to what does the industry need, or even more, what does the client need? Yeah, the task of a gem lab is to test gemstones. We are testing particular properties, and um, we are testing the identity of a gemstone, whether it is an authentic material, meaning formed in nature, or whether it's something synthetic, man-made. We test where it is coming from, so the provenance, and we are also testing whether or not uh, a gemstone has been subjected to some kind of treatment. So our mission is to facilitate uh, the trade of gemstones. When one party is selling a gemstone, the other one is intending to buy it. We give transparency into the authenticity of the material and as such we allow the trade to determine a fair price. So our work is exclusively based on applying scientific analytical methods. So we get a stone from a client and we are just looking at the stone. What is the stone telling us so that we can answer those questions? Identity, authenticity, origin, presence or absence of treatment. And um, we do this by applying certain um, analytical methods. We can basically distinguish them in three categories. One is optical analysis, so by means of uh, magnification slash microscope. We um, look into the stone and the stone is usually telling us something about how it has formed, where it has formed, whether anything was um, changed by nature or by man on that stone. We um, then apply a second category of um, analytical methods, which are um, spectroscopic methods. So we use the visible light, but also other areas of the electromagnetic spectrum, for example, ultraviolet light, infrared light, and these kind of uh, sources or uh, means are giving us information again about the nature of the stone, trace element chemistry, certain structural information, which then allows us to again determine what is the stone, where it is coming from. The third pillar is a uh, chemical analysis, so we do look not forcibly at the main elements, but pretty much at trace element and ultra trace elements, which is something like a what is a fingerprint for a human is then like a chemical fingerprint of that particular mine where the gemstone is coming from. The ICPMS is giving us a very detailed pattern of the trace element concentrations of each particular gemstone. So, say a given ruby, for example, from Burma, compared to another ruby from Mozambique or from Thailand, they basically have the same chemical composition it's aluminium oxide, then they have a little bit of chromium, a little bit of iron, which gives the color, but then they have a wealth of other elements from the periodic table. They're in such a small concentration that it's hard to detect, but B gives us a very valuable, very important clue from which exact location it's coming. And this is what ICPMS is allowing us to retrieve from the stone. We then have to compare it with our reference database. And this database is really a unique asset we are having. We are in the uh, wonderful position to own uh, some 28,000 gemstones from all commercially relevant um, mines, deposits that exist out there in the world or that used to exist. And um, we are simply comparing this pattern of properties of the unknown stone with the pattern of properties of these 28,000 gemstones, which then allows us to say, okay, if that pattern of the unknown stone matches best with this group of gemstones from the reference collection, we can conclude that that stone most likely is coming from that particular location. So the gemstone rating is 
basically reducing the complexity inherent of colored gemstones. We have to understand that for the lay person, it is just very complex. You know, we have dozens of different types of colored gemstones. We have origin, which apparently plays a big role. We have treatments, we have different cuts, we have different sizes and colors. And this might somehow become too complex and the lay person, not only the lay person, maybe also the retail staff or other people in the business are longing for a bit of simplicity and that's what we give with the, um, the gemstone rating because we're taking all those parameters and boil them down to one figure and this helps then the industry but also the privates, the buyers of gemstones to, um, to compare one stone with another one without having to understand all the details and all those dozens of parameters that might affect it. So it gives the clients comparability, it gives them a bit of direction and orientation in this vast realm, in this vast space of colored gemstones. So we have grouped them into different categories. The biggest one is quality. I'm going to elaborate later on what is included in quality. Then there is rarity. And the last one is salience. Um, salience is the property of something, in this case a gemstone, to stick out of the crowd. So what is, how much is it catching my attention um, that I think, I, oh, this is kind of, looks special to me. That's what we mean with the term salience. Let me go back to the quality. Quality in gemstones <clears throat> can be further broken down into different parts. One is color. That's the most important one because we talk about colored gemstones here, not diamonds. Uh, another one is um, transparency and clarity. And the third one is the cut. So color, transparency, clarity and cut contribute or pay in into the quality part of the rating. Color is then further uh, broken down to um, the hue, which is the exact shade of, um, of color. If you think of the rainbow, is it more in the blue, the green, the red, the yellow? Another parameter that pays into the color is the saturation. So is it a very intense saturated color or is it rather a bit of a washed out, pale and um, pastel color? The tone, <clears throat> the tone is the darkness level of a stone, which usually goes hand in hand with the saturation. And the last uh, factor that contributes to the color is a homogeneity. So how equally spread is the color into a gemstone? So much about color. Then we have transparency clarity. This is how many features we have in the gemstone that is affecting that I can look through the stone. And the last part, subgroup of um, quality is the cut. So how good was the job done by the cutter to bring out the most, you know, the best um, visual appearance uh, of a stone. And these three subgroups together pay in into the quality. Then we look at rarity. Rarity um, considers, for example, the identity of the stone. So a ruby is more rare than aquamarine, for example. Um, then the presence or absence or the type of treatment. Of course, a, tr a stone that has been spared from any treatment is much rarer than a stone that has been heated or uh, filled with oil to improve its appearance. A third factor that uh, contributes to the rarity part is uh, the size. So uh, small stones are more abundant than a big stone of a comparable quality. So um, the size of course is also contributing quite a bit to that rarity parameter. Then we have a, a particular feature in gemstones which are grouped into the term um, gemological phenomenon. This is referring to features such as asterism or uh, chatoyancy. So is the gemstone showing a star? Is the gemstone showing a cat's eye? Or is maybe the stone a, a color change a gemstone which further adds uh, points into this uh, rarity category? Also, if a stone is um, fulfilling the, the very strict criteria for a trade color, so pigeon blood, royal blue, crimson red, um, this is also then for adding further points to the rarity uh, group. Gemtelligence is giving us um, a new direction into how gem labs are working or how gemology is developing. 
meaning it does the job which in the past a human expert was doing. Um, so what does a human expert? Um, they take the data that we collect from the different analytical methods and then they try to make sense of that data. So they try to see um, features, salient features that then are helping them determine the origin, determining a treatment. And this task of making sense of the data, trying to look for patterns, um, um, is something which humans are good in doing, but they are not forcibly very consistent in doing. So one expert might have a different background in terms of his scientific, scientific past, in terms of the project he or she was working on um, in, the, in the job. Um, it might also be a source of inconsistency um, from day to day or from year to year. And uh, that is a problem for a gem lab, that's a problem for the industry. If a certain set of data is interpreted not always in exactly the same way, there's a risk that a different result is coming out. That's why a software is probably better in fulfilling that task, or at least it is more consistent. Then what you need to build such a software is a massive amount of data, which we have. We are in the business since 100 years. The type of analytical equipment that we are deploying today, we are using already since a couple of years or in most cases even decades. And that gives us a wealth of data, which is exactly what those data scientists need to train an algorithm. That's what we did.